My name is Monk Rowe, and we're interviewing today for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. It's a great pleasure to have Cale Collins, guitarist, with me today. Thank you very much. Welcome. You're uh, from the Midwest mm -hmm. originally? Yeah, uh, Mideast, we Mid like to call it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, Not quite into the West. Yeah. It, yeah, I was born and raised and live around what they call a tri state area, mm -hmm. uh, Cincinnati. But we live in Indiana, which is just across the border. Right. Kentucky is across the border, so. Did that part of the country have a identifiable style of music that you were growing up with? Um, outside of uh, a lot of bluegrass, a lot of real traditional country music, bluegrass. Uh, pretty eclectic, really. Pretty, uh, uh, a lot of jazz fans, a lot of Dixieland fans and everything. <clears throat> but if there was one, I would say it would be bluegrass, probably. Yeah. Bluegrass has, uh, you played probably some bluegrass mm -hmm. then. Yeah, I right? sure did. I played when I was very small, I played uh, mandolin, mm -hmm. uh, bluegrass uh, sort of situation. Did any of the music that you learned in that situation help you in the jazz world? Oh, yes, yeah, quite a bit. Uh, I would guess, I would say that bluegrass is really the, the, uh, the jazz of that kind of music because so much of it is uh, off the top of your head mm -hmm. you know, type thing. A lot of, uh, a, a, bluegrass, a bluegrass musician really plays the same song all the time, for instance, you know, a lot of times, but uh, a little bit different every time, just a little bit different. So it leans towards improvisation <coughs> quite a bit then. Yeah. Quite a bit, yeah. And a lot of technical things, a lot of uh, fast, <laughs> really fast yeah. tempos, you know, and a very good musicianship. Yeah. Direction. I've always looked at those mandolin players and wondering, yeah. it's such a small little area to deal oh, with, I it know seems it. like. I know it. And they're speeding bullets, so you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, um, your education in music, was it mostly self-taught? Yeah. Okay. All. I didn't all, take, all uh, there was no formal training at all, not a bit. Mm -hmm. So it was all in the ears then? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, all of it. Uh, uh, later on, well, it was after I got out of the Army, actually. I was about 26, I think, or something, 25, 26. And uh, there were people around uh, the area that had, uh, you know, music stores, and they always have uh, little music studios where they teach you know, kids and beginners and everything. And uh, so they were after me to do some teaching. I said, well, I don't know anything about it, uh, about that end of it. And they and uh, they said, well, let's, you know, just get a Mel Bay book one and go through it and then keep ahead of them, you know. <laughs> and so that's how I did that part of it. <laughs> you were of, teaching yourself. Teaching myself, <laughs> right. As yeah. you went along. Yeah. yeah. Well, but sometimes the, the the best teachers are the ones that have had the practical experience. Yeah, I would think you know. so, yeah. And they can keep ahead. Uh, it's very easy to, to look at the paper and see what I was doing and you know, that type of thing, for uh -huh. beginners especially. Right. And even uh, like the, uh, the advanced players, some of the players that came in, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, they weren't too much interested in uh, the book, the reading, the music. They were interested in techniques and Mm -hmm. uh, different chord positions uh, and all that kind of thing. So it worked out good. So what was your first gig? Can you remember mm -hmm. what would have been your first <clears throat> gig? I was five. You were five. <laughs> yeah, and had a little small guitar, and it was in Westport, Indiana. And uh, I played and sang uh, Hand Me Down My Walking Cane. And I was five years old. And they gave me $5 which was an awful lot of oh, money then. Five dollar bill for my f fifth birthday was just right after my birthday. Wow. Yeah, I had that five dollar bill for years. <laughs> it almost sounds like uh, that Elvis story, that he was at a county fair or something yeah. and he won about second prize. Yeah, about the same thing. But it was so, it was, it was so neat. Uh, God, you know, five dollars. That was in, I was born in 1933. Mm -hmm. I'm 64. So uh, 
Uh, that was in 1938 then, around through there. And five dollars, good grief. It's a down payment on a car, <laughs> I guess, almost. <laughs> That's coming out of the Depression. Yeah. It was, it was uh, what, mid-30s, I guess. Yeah. I should right check my history that. book, but yeah. Um, yeah, that would have to be right in the a, middle a, of a it. nice chunk of money. Yeah, real nice chunk. Because I can remember uh, mm, everybody scuffling. That was a pretty rough time. Uh, most of my people were into farming, so we had, uh, you know, plenty of food on the table of, of sorts, you know. But uh, some of the people, uh, I can remember, it was, that was a rough time yeah. for a working man. And so you were a teenager during World War II? Mm hmm Or mm -hmm. almost, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember, how did the war affect uh, the area where you lived and the, the people? Uh, pretty, pretty much. Uh, a lot of uh, flag waving, red, white, and blue type things, you know, in that part of the country. All, all over, I guess, really. Not that much difference. And, uh, of course, when I was a kid, uh, I'm very interested in uh, flying, aviation. Uh, used to fly quite a bit. Uh, had my own license, private license and everything. But at that time, uh, and we would get into, me and my brothers and cousins, you know, we would get into building model airplanes, you know, mm -hmm. the, the P-51s and the P-38s and all that. We were really into that <laughs> type of thing. Did the music of World War II get into your head oh, at yeah. that time? There was a lot of great tunes written during that era. Uh, of course, the 20s and the 30s and all that, some of the best music, I guess, that there is. Uh, but uh, some of the tunes that came out from that, from the war thing, there's some great tunes, great tunes, White Cliff of Dover, I'll Be Seeing You, or and all that kind of stuff, you know. Great tunes, some really uh -huh. good tunes, yeah. Do you ever remember any of the, the big bands at the time coming mm -hmm. through your area? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember uh, at a very early age, uh, I became very interested in, uh, in uh, jazz without really knowing what it was, I guess. Because uh, I'd, had, I'd had my own radio <clears throat> the whole bit. And uh, at that time, you could just tune in any, almost any station on the radio and you could hear good music, good big bands, uh, Woody Herman, uh, the old, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, uh, and Nat King Cole trios, uh, Paige Cavanaugh, I think, was one of them, maybe. Some real good groups, very good groups. Was Benny Goodman still, he was hot. He right? was hot about that time, and I got very, I loved his uh, trio things, you know, the, the trio and the quartets, the small things. Uh, he was really an idol of mine, and, uh, you know, took until I was, how old was I when I joined him? It was in 76, I think, 76 when I joined him. And I was with him for about four years. Okay. So that was... Uh, We'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, rewinding just a moment to, to bluegrass. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you read very often a quote from, I guess, jazz historians or sociologists, and they say that jazz is the only true American art form. Mm -hmm. But I wonder about that <clears throat> statement uh, <clears throat> in referring to bluegrass, for instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where does bluegrass come from, if not America? Yeah, that's yeah, that's right. I guess maybe maybe they figured that the origins of bluegrass were really uh, UK, you know, from the uh, from Scotland and Ireland and mm -hmm. England and well, Wales and all that, because some of that music is very very similar. You can yeah. you know the fiddles and the the reels and the jigs Celtic and the music, yeah I guess. yeah that stuff. So maybe they figure that because of that, because the origin maybe was there mm -hmm. instead of here in the right. in this country. Yeah, that might be it. Yeah. I guess you can trace things back far enough. You can say they came from somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. What about blues? Um, <clears throat> was blues a, a kind of music that you heard mm -hmm. as a child? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, in old country music, uh, uh, even the bluegrass, some of the bluegrass, some of those breakneck, breakneck speed uh, type things uh, are based on blues changes. Mm -hmm. So many of them, so many tunes are. Uh, 
the old, uh, you know, one, what do they call them, one, three, five changes, and right. that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. What was that? One, four, five. Oh, <laughs> one, four, five, okay. One, one four, two, three, let's see, one, two, three, one, two, three, three, one, four, five, okay. I have, have a little music theory lesson here. <laughs> Okay, C, F, and see, D7. <laughs> see, that's, that's interesting, though, because the, the player doesn't have to talk about it. They just have to play it. Just play it. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then you had a period in, in the service. Mm -hmm. Was this in the, let's say, in the 50s? Yeah, right yeah. in the mid-50s, yeah. Did you yeah. get to play during your service career? No, no I didn't, no. Uh, they sent me to helicopter school, of course, in the Army, you know, being... I've had all that experience in fixed wing flying. I oh. learned to fly when I was about 16, around 16. Well, I had to be 16, yeah. And fixed wing never, uh, never even was inside of a chopper, or maybe for a ride or two or something like that. So the Army, of course, sends me to school, helicopter, helicopter school, spent all that money. And, uh, I really didn't fly that much in helicopter. Flew more fixed wing than I did in mm -hmm. helicopter, but it was with Transportation Corps at that uh -huh. time, uh, uh, and I was right in between the two war things there, so I didn't right. miss that. Yeah. Right. Fortunately, we look back on the '50s as uh, age of uh, innocence, I suppose, and somewhat prosperity mm -hmm. after the war. Did the 50s seem like that to you? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. Uh, um, I never had any problem after, for instance, well, before I went into the Army and after I went into the Army. I didn't have too much of a problem uh, getting work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not too much. But the, uh, the uh, Bill Haley and the Comets and all that, the rock and roll really got into it as far as popularity was concerned, I think. It started real good music, uh, big band and jazz and all that, sort of faded from the limelight, and here come Elvis and all that right. stuff, you know. And at the same time, you had uh, jazz turning to bebop, yeah. I guess, somewhat. Oh, I, I was really into that. I loved that change. It just fit, seemed like it just fit me just perfectly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really liked that. I can remember the first times, uh, the first times that I heard people like uh, Parker and, and uh, Miles and some of those people. And uh, then later on, of course, uh, some of the real good tenor players I loved, man, Stan Getz and all that thing, you know. But, uh, I don't know. It, uh, the bebop was a, a new direction for the music, and I loved it. Yeah. Still do. Uh -huh. I consider myself a bebop player, I guess. <laughs> Technically, is it? Um, do you think it's harder to play Charlie Parker type lines on your instrument than, let's say, on the saxophone? I don't think so. No. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of guitar players, I think, maybe. Uh, there's a lot of them that do can play lines like that, bebop lines. But uh, a lot of guitar players, myself included, are really uh, influenced by the straight ahead mainstream swing uh, guitar, Barney Kessel type things and all that thing. You know. mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I think Barney Kessel probably influenced more guitar players that are you know, around my age, maybe, or, or younger or something, than uh, people give him credit for. Even though he's not all that older, Barney's, of course, he's in bad shape now. I think Barney maybe is like 13 years older than I am, so uh -huh. that would make him probably 76 or something like that now. Yeah. But he influenced a lot of players. Yeah. They usually mention Charlie Christian, perhaps, more mm -hmm. than him. Charlie Christian, but, yeah, of course. Yeah. But he was not well, around for very long, mm -hmm. unfortunately. That was one of uh, Barney Kessel's major influences. Okay. And the Redheads, uh, it was one of his, he talks about him all the time. Uh, Herbie Ellis. Oh, and the Redheads? The Redhead. I call him the Redhead. Or the, or the Farmer. I call him the Farmer once in a while because he was born in Farmersville, Texas. Uh -huh. so he calls me the Hillbilly and I call him the Farmer. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you've been around the country. You've lived in, in a number of places. You went mm -hmm. moved to L.A. for a while. Is that right? No, I didn't. I didn't live there. I was just. Oh, uh, you just worked. Worked there. Yeah, mm -hmm. worked there in San Francisco. Uh, recording. That's when I was in the Concord years. When I was with Concord Jazz. Okay. And did a lot of work out there and stayed there. You know, two weeks at a time. That type of thing. Yeah. I see. But I've always been, uh, I've always, I've always uh, lived around the area, Cincinnati area. Uh, I was planning on moving to New York, and uh, Benny talked me out of it. Benny Goodman talked me out of it. Uh, he said, I hear you want to move to New York, you know, and, I, and why, he said. I said, well, don't you, is that the thing to do? He says, not n anymore, not necessarily. He said, you live uh, 35 minutes from, uh, International Airport, Cincinnati, and most of the gigs that you get are overseas and East Coast, West Coast. You get on the airplane and go. So why, yeah, why move to New York? He talked me right out of it. I'm glad he did. <laughs> yeah. Well, he knew he lived right there. Yeah. And yeah. How did that gig come about with him? Uh, it really Jack Sheldon was probably more responsible for me getting a gig with him than anybody. I'm sure. Uh, I played at a jazz club in Cincinnati, a local club, and house band, you know, house trio. I had the band once in a while where I'd play with somebody who was a co-op band, quartet type of thing. And we had a lot of, uh, we would import names, you know, big, you know, jazz names and everything. And Sheldon was one of them that come in quite a bit to do his <clears throat> little comedy routine yeah. and his playing and everything. And uh, as it turned out, Sheldon and uh, Goodman were very good friends. Goodman really likes him, really liked him, you know, because he was funny or something. And he asked Sheldon about, uh, he said, I'm going to go on a tour overseas, and I need a guitar player. And Jack recommended me. So, uh, so uh, Goodman's uh, secretary, Muriel, what was her last name? Zuckerman. Zick Zuckerman. Muriel Zuckerman, and she called me. I was living in Mount Adams and my bachelor pad. That was before Susie and I. And uh, so one morning about 10 o'clock, she calls and says, uh, I'm with Benny Goodman's office, and we were wondering if you would want to send you a ticket and you come out and play a gig with him up in Dearborn, Michigan, I think it was. And I thought, First, it was one of those things, you know. Says, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> she said, "I'm serious. I'm serious." And then I, uh, I finally realized that she was uh, on the square, and I said, "Absolutely." I said, "I'll do it." Mm -hmm. Yeah. I said, "I figured that I couldn't miss that opportunity, yeah. even if it was just a one-shot deal." So it turned out all right. And he said, "Well, you're hired if you want to do it." I said, "Okay." We're so, in a sense, it was an audition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In a sense, it was. Yeah. It and was a gig up in uh, Dearborn. It was for some kind of a Ford party, you know, a Ford Motor Company party, some kind of thing. And uh, it worked out good. Do you remember who else was on that gig? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it was uh, John Bunch, played the piano. Let's see, uh, Connie Kay, because that was when the MJ Cube was, wasn't happening for oh. a while. As a matter of fact, Connie Kay played almost all the time that I was with him, too. You know, the, both of us were together at the same time. And who was on bass? I've forgotten now. <clears throat> I think it was Nobby Tota. You remember him? Don't remember that name. He used to, uh, Nobby Tota, T-O-T-A-H. Uh, he used to play quite a bit with uh, Johnny Smith uh -huh. on some of his old uh, recordings, Royal Roost, I think it was. And uh, that, that was about it. Let's see, Warren Vache, he was on it. And later on, Scott Hamilton played quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So it was a good uh, quintet, real good one. Now, in that kind of situation, did he have music for mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in addition to having to be a good player with a, with a right attitude to please Benny, I guess, mm -hmm. yeah. you had to know all the tunes. <clears throat> yeah. And, did yeah. you have an idea when you got on the stand, like, what's he going to call? Uh, uh, it, it really didn't make too much difference. He would call tunes that I was very familiar with. I'd been listening to them for years. That's what we all did, really. Uh, uh, we would just uh, 
we knew how he played the tune, and, uh, and uh, it was like that. It was real easy. It was real easy. It's mm -hmm. like you've been doing it all your life. Now, the only, the times that I was with him, the about four years, I'll say, uh, we probably never did any more than six big band things, you know, the big band things, about a half a dozen of them. The rest of them were all very small, quartet, mm -hmm. quintet, sextet, and all that stuff. So with a big band thing, I had chord charts and everything that I could sort of read mm -hmm. <laughs> a little bit, you know. But it was easy. Yeah, mm -hmm. There was nothing to it. We knew his, uh, everything he did. <laughs> well, that's the fascinating part about jazz sometimes. Is, mm -hmm. know, how are they doing that? Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And you had to have a pretty big uh, collection of tunes in your memory, I would yeah, say. Yeah, you do. Oh, uh, I've had people, uh, you know, that are into that, you know, maybe professional gamblers or something that would tell me and a bunch of musicians that you have no idea how many tunes you know. You have no idea. It's in the thousands, literally. <laughs> yeah. And you're not even aware of it. I know it's got to be true because once in a while I'll play a tune, somebody will call a tune or if I'm playing with a singer, uh, that I know that I haven't played for years, and, but it's right there. Wow. Yeah. That's one of those things. Yeah. Does it get difficult uh, mentioning singers that, you know, they'll say body and soul, could we do it in A or something? <laughs> <laughs> do we have to? Oh, I love that, yeah, I love that. I think mo uh, a lot of guitar players can they, can, they love to play in those bright keys we call mm -hmm. them, you know, the A and D yeah. and E and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, but some of the newer ones, of course, they, they read real well, they're used to reading the the tenor keys and the alto keys and all that. But, uh, yeah, I like to play in those different different keys. Why is it, it seems the majority of standards from the 30s and so forth are written in flat keys? Mm-hmm. Is mm -hmm. that, do you know why that would be? I, I don't know. It, it has to do, I imagine, with the, uh, with the horns, you know, B flat, for trumpet, generally, yeah. you know, A flat for, or E flat for e alto, e you know, yeah. that kind of thing. I imagine that's the reason. Right. Yeah. So when they transpose, it puts them in good yeah. keys. And yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Maybe piano players tend to go to the flats more, yeah. too. I, so many singers love to sing in five flats, uh, which is, you know, it's just a right away from, just a half step away from C, and I always wonder, why in, why in the world don't you do it in C instead, <laughs> instead of D flat, <laughs> you know? <laughs> what would your fellow musicians think if you took out a capo and put it on? <laughs> they would say, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a jazz guitar player with a capo. No. Um, it's not. Uh, some of the blues players uh, use them quite a bit. Some of right. the old, uh, Oh, one of my favorites, I was on tour with him, with that, we were on tour, I was on tour twice with, uh, what do they call that, uh, Masters of the Steel String Guitar. Oh. It was uh, uh, some kind of endowment thing, arts endowment thing. Right. And uh, John uh, Cephas, is that his name? Yeah. Yes. John Cephas. John Cephas. Yeah. And he would, you know, do the slide bar and all that. I just loved him, he was something else. Mm -hmm. And he would use a capo once in a while, right. some of those, so they could take advantage of those open keys yeah. and everything. But uh, the jazz musician, jazz guitarist, I don't know of any that ever did. <laughs> I'd be If I gave you five bucks, would you do that tonight so we could get it on film? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know how to use it. I know. <laughs> I really wouldn't. I wouldn't know how to use right. the thing. <laughs> well, some of the rock players nowadays also, they tune their guitars down a half step, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, they and do. I don't know the reason for that. Well, I think it's probably they they tune it down because it automatically makes the the uh, strings looser. Mm -hmm. Of course, they get looser, and they love to bend, bend the uh, you know bend it, and then turn it into the amplifier to make that ridiculous, horrible noise <laughs> for five minutes or so. <laughs> so. I trust I'm not going to hear any feedback from you tonight no. on the stage. <laughs> no wah wah pedals and no, <laughs> no feedback, none of that kind of thing. <laughs> Do you play a, a hollow body mm -hmm. um, Benedetto. electric? Uh -huh. Yeah, Benedetto. He's, uh, he's a, uh, a private builder, you know, one of those, he's one of the best ones in the world. Yeah. You know. 
So you counted um, in your influences, mm -hmm. Charlie Christian, perhaps, and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, just about all the uh, oh. older guitar players. But actually, when I was growing up and through that phase there, actually my uh, my influences were piano players. Yeah, because I wanted to mimic those beautiful chord things uh, that they were doing and try to get as close to them as I could mm -hmm. on the guitar. That's how I learned a lot of chords on the things, listening to piano players. Yeah. Some of the reviews I've read about you mention the, uh, the fact that sometimes you can sound like two people. Yeah. Maybe, a, does that come from listening to piano players trying to I think so. do everything? I think so. I think that's why, because I have sort of an unorthodox uh, style both hands, really. You know, I can play bass lines and chords at the same time and maybe a little melody here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of unorthodox. And use the thumb, which you're not supposed to do, and the nails plus a pick and that type of thing. But uh, I think that's right. I think it was uh, the influence of the, mm -hmm. the piano players, especially the Tatums and Fats Waller do yeah. incredible things, and I know that I'd never do anything on the guitar like that, but come as close as I could, you know, with, and uh, George sharing some of that pretty stuff that he did, and later on Bill Evans, mm -hmm. and that type of thing. Yeah. I have a quote here from uh, the Grove Dictionary of Jazz, and it's talking about you, and he says, a technically well-equipped, fluid, and exciting soloist, Collins has forged a highly eclectic style. In fact, you used the word eclectic when you were talking about where you grew up. <clears throat> yeah, the yeah. music, yeah. yeah. Probably comes from all that, from listening to different uh, uh, kinds of music. For instance, in that Cincinnati area, uh, around through there, there's a lot of uh, old, uh, there's a lot of German uh, population, and mm -hmm. they, they love to play some of the Dixieland, sort of Dixieland, and the, you know, the two-beat stuff, you know, and I loved that when I was a kid. It was different music. I sort of, what I did was try to, uh, I don't know if I did it on purpose or if I thought I should to, for my uh, further education, is try to just absorb as much music as I could. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I figured now there's no way I can put down a certain kind of music if I don't listen to it and try to see what it is. How can I make any kind of judgment on it? Mm -hmm. So I, I liked it all. If it's good, any music is good, I like. Okay. <laughs> is that kind How of a about, broad? Let's see. <laughs> Chuck Berry. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, there's some of the things that he did I liked, and uh, I never was a fan of, I was more of a fan of his than. Uh, Oh, the other guy that everybody went crazy about, uh, the guitar player that played with his teeth and everything. Oh, Jimi Hendrix? Yeah, Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. I never was a fan of his because too much at all. I like more of the blues, the old Texas blues uh, guys that uh, would play. Uh, it, was, it was more exciting. And they, it seemed like they played more of the guitar. Uh-huh. Yeah. Is there a definition for Texas swing? Mm. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I love Texas Swing, yeah. I just, I, I automatically think of uh, you know, Bob Wills, uh, Spade Cooley, uh, and there's a couple more of them, but those two were prominent. But I love that music. It had such, such sort of, uh, uh, had jazz roots of some kind. Mm -hmm. uh, they always had a couple, three guitar players that could really swing their tails off. And real hot fiddle players that played uh, sort of like Stefan Grappelli, you know, like the real good stuff and all that thing. But I love Texas Swing. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I, would, I would play it if I could be hooked up with one of those guys, I yeah. think. Yeah, that would be fun. There's some new uh, bands out, by the way, you, as you're aware of, I'm sure. Uh, some new groups that, that try to play that music sort of like it was. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know the names of them. Sleep at the Wheel or something like that. And yeah. Some yeah. of those. They've yeah. been around long, quite yeah. a while. But and they really play yes. good. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, they have a real good singer, a real tall fellow. I don't know if his name is Asleep or what. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> be, yeah. But he's the leader. But he's I, the leader, I actually yeah. have to hear them once. Yeah. They do. They're oh, pretty it's authentic. great. I love it, yeah. What's it like um, trying to get yourself on record? 
these days? Mm, it's pretty hard. It really is pretty hard. I see some body <laughs> language over there that tells me that... Uh, it, it, it's, it's pretty hard because uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good taste in the first place to, uh, to get one together and the distribution and the whole bit and all that uh, marketing. Uh, so you really have to get a hold of somebody that wants to do it for you. And I've been pretty lucky once, you know, here and there and there and here. Of course, Concord Jazz really did a number real good for a bunch of us. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on as a leader and a, and a featured soloist and a featured side man and just plain old side man, 32 or 30, 36, 32, 36 I think it is. Mm. Different uh, albums with wow. Concord, yeah. So, and, and uh, of course, the albums you have to have some albums out uh, on the market before anybody can hear you. you. You know, they have to hear you. They can't just uh, you can't rely on playing uh, uh, a local uh, venue. You have to get out and do that. Let people know who you are. That you're around. And then. How do you get it on the radio? To that's that's pretty easy. The, mostly, uh, it really is. Uh, uh, Susie and I, my wife, uh, is my manager. By the way, she's mm -hmm. my manager. She she's really into that thing, and she knows. We both know, and her especially, a lot of uh, people in the college, the college uh, stations that feature a jazz mm -hmm. program once in a while. Uh, make sure that they have all the new tapes or an old tape or something that they play, uh, that type of thing, all over the country, really. And uh, there's, qu there's quite a few of them that do that. They play me pretty regularly on those jazz stations, right. call them that. So I'm, I'm played pretty regular there, and uh, uh, oh, that helps. That helps tremendously get you gigs. Like, do you know. the um, distributors, I can address this to either of you, are they pretty honest with as a rule giving you what you're owed for as a rule there I think they're I think mostly well uh, the distributorship and all of those people they make money by what's popular and of course what's popular is uh, rock and roll or heavy metal or something like that so they give more emphasis I'm sure to marketing those products uh, I think Buddy Rich once said on Carson's show that if marketing in general, all over the advertising marketing people, would give jazz musicians only 1% of the monies and, uh, and promotions and everything as they do to country and rock and roll, we'd be satisfied, we'd be all right. But uh, jazz is not a popular music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, so we're at the bottom of the rung as far as uh, throwing money into it to promote it, and, yeah. and that's a damn shame, but that's the way it is. In your career, was there a time, what, what span of years would you say jazz was most popular? Or has it... In my been, time? Yeah. In my time? Probably from the time I was born to to, uh, it started, it seemed like it started petering out in the, in the 50s, somewhere in the 50s that we had to scuffle around and of course there was a lot of bars that you could play, uh, you know, cocktail lounges and all that, that you could play mm -hmm. some pretty nice, easy light jazz. But um, it started petering out, I guess, around especially 1960. It was more, more takeover from more rock and roll. Yeah. Of course, country's always been there. Everybody loves country music, it seems like. Mm -hmm. But it, it was pretty, got pretty rough about the 60s, you know, about 60, about 1960. It's kind of interesting when you listen to some of um, the early rock and roll records. I, I noticed Chuck Berry especially is that he was moving into a rock and roll thing, but the guys behind him were still playing swing. Mm -hmm. And there was this kind of bumpy transition. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, uh, a lot of those guys played uh, the straight ahead uh, rhythm and blues, which I still like, you know, the organ trios and all that. I think it really swings, it really sounds good. 
and they were sort of into that. Connie Kay, as a matter of fact, when he was younger, he played with the uh, R and B's bands quite a bit. Connie Kay, no. Problem. Yeah, with the backbeat, heavy backbeat, uh. and all that stuff, and uh, honky tonk, and whatever those, you know, some of those people. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, they did change it to this other stuff, whatever it is. Uh, you were saying Chuck Berry's sidemen were doing, changing their, changing their the way they played. Right. Yeah. Way to play. I don't know. Rock and roll. I just really can't. Huh? I don't hate it. I'm just anti it. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in mentioning Connie Kay and that Goodman uh, gig, it makes me think about the f he was one of the first, Goodman was one of the first fellows to have an integrated band mm -hmm. of any note. Mm -hmm. um, What's your take on the, the racial <clears throat> balance in, in music today, or is, do you have any views on that? In all music, all or, or well, I'm talking jazz, jazz mostly. Jazz especially. Yeah. Uh, it's good and healthy, I think, because uh, uh, I don't know some of the like a venue like this. Uh, and this type of jazz, which I sort of call mainstream, I think, maybe, maybe that's a good term. And there's so many of us, so many of us uh, around my age, a little younger, a little older, uh, black and white, that play and love that kind of music. Mm -hmm. But there is a separation, I think, of, of sorts. Uh, there are uh, venues where you have, uh, they'll call them, uh, uh, jazz uh, festivals or something and it's really not it's more pop it's more of the pop thing than jazz it's mm -hmm. not too much jazz I don't think it's played uh, um, oh for instance if uh, what's some of the Tony Tennille and and mm -hmm. some of those singers that, that uh, sing pop tunes I mean uh, standards ballads it's pretty and it's nice but it it really doesn't come off with that feeling, you know. I'd rather hear Rosemary Clooney sing it, or I'd rather hear, uh, you know, uh, Sarah sing it, or Ella, uh, yeah, and that type of thing than some of those because they don't know how to treat it for mm -hmm. some reason. Yeah, but I think it's, uh, I think it's, 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 it's pretty healthy, uh, and these festivals. Uh, uh, different festivals around the country, around the world, really, uh, give all of us a chance to get together. Maybe haven't seen each other or played with each other for a year or two years, and it's like a real good party, you know, that type of thing. It's an interesting and fortunate phenomenon, I think, that these things exist mm -hmm. for the yeah. musicians. And yeah. uh, I it's do notice that the audience, and most of them, is is usually mostly white. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Mostly white. That's yeah. They are, uh, and I don't really know why. I really don't know why. Uh, I imagine that there's uh, several views on it, but I really can't put a finger on it. I really mm -hmm. don't know why that is. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm I'm glad to see that there's uh, some talented younger players that are basically playing what we'll call mainstream. Yeah. You know, Harry Allen and, and those fellas. And yeah. Keeping yeah. that alive. Yeah. I know, and, and uh, we have an excellent school uh, in Cincinnati, uh, Cincinnati uh, Conservatory of Music. It's pretty well known all over the country. And uh, I'm really delighted to see maybe two or three top notch even if it's only two or three come out of there a year that can really play, I mean, really are good players, uh, it's very rewarding mm -hmm. to see that, you know, because it means that jazz is not dead and it never will be, never will be, not with that kind of thing going on. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, the whole education thing is an interesting uh, thing to look at. You know, there is some great teaching going on. Mm -hmm. I hope they have places to play. Yes, when they, when they get finished with their education. Well, remember, it hasn't been that long ago where jazz education 
was non-existent in, in the universities and the colleges. It mm -hmm. never occurred. It wasn't there. If you wanted to take uh, guitar lessons, uh, it was classical. And even then, it was sort of thin. You know, the guitar, mm -hmm. what's that? <laughs> That's Roy Rogers, you know, out on the plains or something like that. But it's really gratifying to see. Uh, there, I have two, there's two exceptional young men in the Cincinnati area that are really playing very good guitar, really good. And one of them is only 21. Andy's only, what, 21, I think? Was he 23? How'd that happen? <laughs> So it's really, uh, it's really nice to see that, yeah. see that come down. Yeah. It makes it all worthwhile. Well, your most recent, I think it's an Ohio style. Mm -hmm. Is that your most recent record? N no. As a leader. As, as a leader, leader yeah, mm -hmm. as a leader it is. The, the other, a uh, couple more as a co-leader. Let's see, I'm on a thing called Tenderly. What record is that? What label do they call that? I think it's a, it's a, it's a independent type owned uh, thing and uh, oh I did that tribute to uh, Wes Montgomery uh, thing with a, a whole bunch of us a whole bunch of guitar players uh -huh. did a tribute to Wes Montgomery uh -huh. uh, that was released in Tokyo long before it was released over here about a year or so maybe before it was released uh, released over here that was on uh, so that's really the last thing major that I did and this mm -hmm. other one tenderly and then I've got a thing coming up. How was that? The Bob Barnard thing. The what? Bob Barnard thing. Oh yeah, that's the other. That's yeah. Uh, there's an uh, a Australian trumpet player. You know him, I'm sure. Bob Barnard. I've seen his yeah. name. And I did a recording with him uh, less than two years ago in New York. Uh, I think that was the, the Canadian label. Uh, oh, I forgot the name of it now. Sackville or something like that? Sackville is a, Sackville, is that's a, it, yeah. yeah. It was on Sackville. Well, with the, um, the, the Ohio album, you used your, your own Yeah, group. Used, it used sounded great, thing. too. Yeah, that's, that was real nice. And used the same, used the quartet that I used around the Cincinnati area. Mm -hmm. And once in a while, we do go out uh, as a self-contained group, but not, not too often, because it's, when you get into a self-contained group, Oh boy! Oh boy! You're talking about money, <laughs> headaches, this and that. You know, it gets rough. Yeah, it gets rough. it's hard to keep a, yeah. a band working it really enough is, to, yeah. that you can tell all the fellows stick with me. Yeah. <laughs> How many is there? Phil Phil Woods, uh, Oscar Peterson trios, uh, uh, Dave Brubeck. That's about it. I can't yeah. think of you know self-contained groups. Well, I have to ask you why tumbling tumbleweeds. <laughs> <laughs> that was well, clever. In fact, when I was listening to it, I wasn't looking at I was just listening to it. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? What Wait is that? What is that tune? <laughs> and it was an interesting choice yeah. and treatment. Uh, I don't know. We, uh, I used to play uh, years ago at the Playboy Club, uh, me and uh, Mike Moore. Mike Moore is also from the Cincinnati area. And, uh, and Ron McCurdy, a drummer, we had a trio. We played at the Playboy Club. And we used to play things like uh, along the Navajo Trail. But we'd do it in like a 6 8 time, you know, real fast. And this and that. And I've always thought, how would that sound, you know? Because uh, it's a great tune, you know. It may, might make a good jazz uh, mm -hmm. vehicle. And uh, so we did it. <laughs> we just did it. <laughs> it's a neat tune. Yeah, it works. It reminded me of. You know, Brubeck did a, a thing on Camp Town Races. Yeah, yeah, Remember that? yeah. Sort of that type of, yeah. uh, you know, feeling and all that stuff. And then a friend of mine, uh, right after that, uh, 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 a group recorded that tune. And it was real nice. She was a fiddle player. She was a fiddle player from Portland, I think, Oregon and around through there somewhere. And part of those guys that were on that... Uh, Steel mastered the steel string guitar tour, mm -hmm. knew her and recorded with her, and they did that thing too. And it was, it's, I just like the tune. I, that sort uh -huh. of drifts along. Yeah. <laughs> and you have been uh, different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Been to Japan. Yeah. Yeah. Do you like playing abroad? Yeah, I do. I really do. Uh, 
once in a while, I've done it very often. I've been overseas many, many times. And, and they always, it seems like the venue always gives you uh, uh, a chance to, every other day, you know, you have off. Oh. Yeah, which is nice, so you can sort of uh, look around in the shops and all that kind of stuff. But then after business, especially if you've been to the same place several times, it just gets to be another gig, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> another long ride on the airplane. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I've always enjoyed it, yeah. In practical sense, I've always wondered what, what you fellas do with your instruments on those flights. Oh. <laughs> Cross, your Cross your fingers. Cross your fingers, yeah. yeah. I just, most of the guitar players get in the habit of, uh, oh, I, you know, loosen the strings and pack the case with uh, all kinds of padding and then tie a big leather belt around it and hand carry it to the jetway so it's the last thing that goes on the airplane and the first thing that comes off. And I've only had about one major wreck. Three? Oh, yeah, that's right, I've had three of them, including that <laughs> next thing. So um, that's, you know, three fixable mm -hmm. things in uh, 28 years or whatever. Yeah. You know, that's not too bad. What's it like playing with uh, musicians from other countries? Is, is, does the music it's cross the border lines? It's a real treat. I love it. Uh, there's a lot of excellent musicians uh, uh, all over the place. Uh, uh, England has, uh, the UK has many of them, uh, Sweden and, and, uh, and Denmark has a lot, uh, Australia has a lot, and Japan is coming on with a few, uh, and uh, it's, it, it's all about the same because they, they've copied so much of the American jazz thing. The only jazz that seems uh, that you can really tell that is a little bit different are the Australians. It's a, it's a different, uh, it's hard to pin down, but it's a different feeling. Um, they write a lot of tunes, a lot of tunes that you never heard of, mm -hmm. <laughs> that type of thing, but they fit good. Uh, uh, but maybe it's, if there is a, uh, a pattern or a system or something, uh, that most jazz musicians maybe follow, uh, they don't particularly. It's a little bit different. It's something you can't put your finger on. Excellent musicians, too, by the way. Just Isn't great. Isn't there one on the bill tonight? Australian player. Oh, there is. is. John Alred or something? Yeah, he's on. He's on. Yeah, he's on. I don't know his work that well. I know several of them, but uh, I don't think I know his work that well. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, you may know better by the but time But I may all know better by the end of the night <laughs> or the yeah. end of the weekend. Yeah. 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 That's neat. Can you think of anything that uh, I might want to ask Hal? Hmm. We've covered pretty much. Yeah. We've covered it pretty good. You, young, ain't, you ain't too bad. Young <laughs> guitar players coming up these days. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I think there's too much music to listen to. <laughs> yeah. What do you think they should zone in on if they're a jazz, yeah. young jazz aspiring player? Yeah, the only thing I don't like about so many of the new uh, young guitar players is uh, they seem to think that the faster single line things that they play, the better they are. Mm -hmm. And some of them are really excellent. They do very, they're very fast with single lines, just, you know, like a horn, just a single lines. And they've forgotten, and I always tell them at clinics when I do that, I said, you guys have forgotten one big thing. You have a small orchestra there in your hands. You have six strings, you have beautiful chordal things that you can get. I said, you don't, you don't pay any attention to any chords. You just want to play faster single line things. I said, don't do that. So play some chords, play some chords, you know. So that's the only uh, beef that I got uh, against uh, uh, about some of those youngsters. They want to play faster than, uh, than Pat, you know, old buddy uh, Messini or uh, some of those other guys. Yeah. You know? They can play lightning fast, but that really doesn't get it. You know, uh, any good guitar player, any real good guitar player can play fast, you know. So. So what? <laughs> Learn some of them chords. <laughs> well, those are good words of wisdom. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I. Um, it's my pleasure. I hope you have a great night tonight and tomorrow. I'm going to this, these. Uh, I've never played a festival of any kind anywhere in the world that I didn't have a ball. It was just really fun. It's really nice. Everybody gets together, gets together, and has a good time. And plus, your old pal Michael Moore will yeah, he'll be, be here. with you. Yeah, yeah, that's terrific. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was my, my pleasure. pleasure. Thanks for joining me. Good. Thank you.